Well, good morning and welcome to Three Rivers live stream, our inaugural Sunday. Excited about the message this morning from Daniel chapter 3. I want to read the meditation from Brian Chapel, his book entitled The Gospel of Daniel. He says, we need not trust in special divinations, revelations, or expressions of sanctified optimism in order to be faithful. We are not lesser Christians because others claim to know more about what circumstances mean than we. We can be content to trust and obey, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. If this simple, obedient faith held them in God's care through a fiery furnace, then we can be content with such a faith in our trials. Other Christians may claim confidence in the fulfillment of personal desires, but we are allowed to claim something deeper and beyond. Confidence in the infinite wisdom and eternal love of our God. Desire plus optimism does not equal faith. Biblical faith is not the stuff dreams are made of. Real faith is tougher and more resilient, more aware of the complexities of a fallen world, and more trusting of a sovereign God. I can think of no better passage that illustrates these truths than Daniel chapter 3. Our call to worship from Psalm 25. And for those of you who are familiar with Daniel chapter 3, maybe you have pre-read it uh, for this week's message. It is the fiery furnace. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego thrown into the fiery furnace furnace. I thought of these words of the psalmist in Psalm 25 in reference to their trial. Psalm 25 verses 1 to 5, to you, O Lord, we lift up our souls. O our God, in you we trust. Let us not be put to shame. Let not our enemies exult over us. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make us to know your ways, O Lord. Teach us your paths. Lead us in your truth and teach us, for you are the God of our salvation. For you we wait all the day long. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these words from the psalmist David, facing things differently as a king, as the subjects Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego faced under the service of an evil king. And yet, Father, we stand alongside of them this day and we say, Father, help us know more of you. Help us to stand firm in trial. Help our enemies to not win the day over us. Help us to recognize what an enemy looks like, what they desire from us. Father, we pray that as we are gathered all over uh, this country and beyond to worship you this morning, that we would bless you. We don't have a 90-foot golden statue with soldiers commanding us to bow down. We have something far greater. The risen Christ beckons us into your throne room. Your spirit confirms that that we belong to you, that we have been washed, that we've been cleansed, that Christ has gone through the fire, and now we can stand before you and we can sing your praises. We can put our trust and our faith in you. And so we pray that our worship this morning would be fitting the greatest king of all, the savior of our souls, the one who has rescued us. We ask these things. In Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. Or 
his throne it shall remain and ever stand all the power all the glory i will trust in his name for my god is the ancient of days though the dread That is our song of the month, Ancient of Days. It comes out of Daniel chapter 7. Just the thought of God calling himself the Ancient of Days uh, should give us great comfort. The call to confession follows from that same Psalm 25, verses 6 and 7. Remember your mercy, O Lord your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. We confess our sins, the ones from our youth, but also our transgressions, even from today and yesterday. We confess them to the Ancient of Days, the one who has seen everything and planned everything, the one who himself is defined by steadfast love. Take a few minutes now before God and confess your sins.
to help us confess our sins, let's sing this song, God Be Merciful to Me. God be merciful to me On thy grace I rest my plea Plenteous in compassion thou Blot out my transgressions now Wash me, make me pure within Cleanse, oh, cleanse me from my sin. My transgressions I confess. Grief and guilt my soul oppress. I have sinned against thy grace and provoked thee to thy face i confess thy judgment just speechless i thy mercy trust broken humbled to the dust by thy wrath and judgment just let my contrite heart rejoice and in gladness hear thy voice from my sins oh hide thy face blot them out in boundless grace Gracious God, my heart renew. Make my spirit right and true. Cast me not away from Thee. Let Thy Spirit dwell in me. Thy salvation's joy impart. Steadfast make my willing heart. Our assurance of God's forgiveness, continuing in Psalm 25. The psalmist writes, Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. We have just kept his covenant in confessing our sins and turning to him. That's what it means to be a covenant people. It doesn't mean that we are without sin when God set up his covenant. He set up a way immediately for his covenant people to be made right, to be washed, to be cleansed. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. <clears throat> who is the man who fears the Lord? Him will he instruct in the way that he should choose. His soul shall abide in well-being, and his offspring shall inherit the land. That is the good news of the gospel from Psalm 25 this morning, that God our Father forgives the humble, keeps, keeps his covenant promise to his people. The grace of God has reached for me. And pulled me from the raging sea and I am safe on the solid ground the Lord is my salvation I will not fear when darkness falls 
His strength will help me scale these walls. I'll see the dawn of the rising sun. The Lord is my salvation. Our Confession of Faith, New City Catechism, question number 20. Who is the Redeemer? The only Redeemer is the Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, in whom God became man and bore the penalty for sin himself. Amen. Uh, what's been great about this series in Daniel, and I encourage you if you've missed any, uh, to go onto our Facebook page or website and catch up, to watch Nebuchadnezzar, uh, to watch each character chapter by chapter, but especially Nebuchadnezzar. He asked that question that we just sung about, who is like the Lord our God and his rebellion against this God and his final bowing of the knee is epic. It's, it's an amazing story. At this time in our worship, we give to the Lord his tithes 
our offerings. There's an address if you'd like to mail a check or, or give on our website. I encourage you to do so. I also encourage you to think about when we put this in our order of worship. It follows after recounting who God is and what He's done. It follows after celebrating His covenant faithfulness. It is in no way uh, an offering to uh, have our sins forgiven or an offering to obligate God. Let's go now to our Lord in prayer. I'm going to borrow some words from Scotty Smith. His prayer based upon Revelation chapter 21 it seems appropriate, given the day, given the time. Revelation 21 says that he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down. For these words are trustworthy and true. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we have longed for the day of no more death. Maybe not so much ever before as we have today or even this season. May it be for us, Father, your promises a source of immeasurable comfort to know that you yourself said, write it down, not in pencil or in chalk, write it down because it is trustworthy and true. For Jesus, your death was the death of death. Oh, Jesus, we praise you that you sit on the throne and we stand every moment of our lives in your grace. And we know that you are in the process even now of making things new. We pray that we would see that, that we would believe it. In light of all the things happening outside of our control, would you remind us that your resurrection was the guarantee. It was the first fruit of a whole new order, the new creation. That you would do away with death and decay in every form. Father, we long for that day and we pray for that day. And we don't have to pick out caskets. We pray for that day. And we don't have to wear masks of any kind. We pray for that day when innocence will be renewed. When every life-robbing pandemic will be gone. When there will no longer be unrealized dreams. Father, we look forward to that day where we won't have to bury even a pet. No environmental disasters, no homicides, no social distancing. And so, Father, as you wipe our tears, as you restore to us a great and eternal hope in Jesus, will you turn our gaze back upon you, living in a day where death for us is not yet annihilated, where decay still reigns, Will you, Father, send us as your people into the valley of the shadow of death? And will you keep us from fearing anything? Oh, Father, you are the grave robber. You are the one who has defeated. You are the one who has given your son in our stead that we may dwell with you forever and ever. Help us to rest in these truths. We ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Sermon title is Faith Under Fire. It's the third sermon in this series from Daniel. Let me give you just a little bit of context. Daniel and his friends, exiles from Judah, brought into Babylon around the year 586. They had resolved themselves, even though they were called into the king's royal chambers, they had resolved themselves that they would not be defiled. They would not be polluted by the gods, the worship, and the culture of Babylon. And so the context for our text is living and serving in a kingdom 
that was dominated and ruled by a king whose anger made outrageous demands. We'll read again, as we did last week, of this king making threats, asking the impossible at times. How does a Christian live in a kingdom like that? It's so great for us. So the first chapter, Daniel says he draws a line in the sand. I'm not going to eat the food that comes from the king's table. And he faces possible death, but the Lord rescues him. In fact, it, it ends with the Lord blessing Daniel and his companions. In verse 20, it says, In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, that he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in his kingdom. And then we come to the second chapter last week. I called this the dream team. The king makes this unbelievable demand. He has a bad and troubling dream, and he makes this demand that all his counselors, all the wise people, that they should tell him not just what the dream meant, but tell him his actual dream. And they're about to be killed when Daniel steps in and saves not only himself and his companions, but he saves all these other evil enchanters and Chaldeans and spiritists. He saves them all because God tells Daniel the king's dream and its meaning. Now, it's interesting that that chapter, when Daniel explains the dream of the king, the king saw a, a giant statue and its head was made of gold. And, and further down the statue, less precious, and more brittle metals and eventually at the bottom it's just feet made of metal and clay and in that dream the king sees a stone and the text tells us in chapter 2 that the stone was not cut by a human hand and the stone was thrown at the statue and the statue is shattered into pieces and the wind blew it away and then the stone itself became a great mountain and Daniel tells the king here's what that dream means you, O king, are the head of gold, and after you all these other kingdoms will come. But after that, there will come a stone that will wipe away all other kingdoms, and itself will be a mountain. Now, if you read any Old Testament prophecy, you know that that is the mountain of the Lord, Mount Zion that we call it. And Jesus himself says, I'm that stone. I'm the one that the builders rejected. And so Nebuchadnezzar is given this beautiful personal revelation about the future. Your kingdom will fall. There'll be another kingdom and another kingdom and another kingdom. But ultimately, there's going to be a kingdom that wipes all of them away. What a beautiful revelation. But it would appear as we read chapter 3 that Nebuchadnezzar failed to apply that to himself. Failed to understand what would be the appropriate response of such a revelation. And in the end of chapter 2, we read again that Daniel is given uh, more understanding than any of those around him. But we also see as chapter by chapter goes that the trials get more intense and direct. You know, the first trial was whether you would eat this food or not. The second trial, really, he had no way of, of getting out of unless the Lord saved him. And then the trial this morning is much more intense and much more fearful for us. Daniel chapter 3. It's a long chapter, uh, but a great story. Daniel chapter 3. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits. That's 90 feet. And its breadth was 9 feet. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And King Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the counselors, the treasurers, the justice, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, all the officials of the province gathered for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. They stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. I'll stop there for just a moment at verse 5. Uh, I don't know if you can see the irony here. Uh, he had a dream that troubled him. 
that the divine God of gods revealed to him, you're going to be destroyed. And he responds by saying, well, I'm going to build a statue and all of it is going to be gold. I'm going to set up a statue and all of it's going to be gold. Now, we're in Oklahoma. When I moved to Oklahoma, uh, there's this big uh, tower in my neighborhood, and it has a giant speaker on it. And that giant speaker likes to go off at about 1 or 2 in the morning. And it is a loud tornado siren. It is so loud that the dogs cringe that all of us, especially those of us who just moved here, we hear and we freak out. We know what it means. There's a tornado nearby. We don't care what time it is. Run for shelter. The king did something similar. He had this giant image set up and he instructed all the people in his kingdom. When you hear this distinct sound, you are to stop whatever you're doing and fall on your face before me. Verse 6. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, all the people, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, the pipe, the tire, the lyre, the trigon, the harp, the bagpipe, every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Now, if you got the notes I emailed, I underline that last part of verse 12. Uh, it is thematic for the character of God's servants. They pay no attention. Well, I wouldn't say that. That's a bit harsh. They do pay attention, but they do not obey when a false king, when a king tells them to serve and worship false gods. 13, Nebuchadnezzar in furious rage commanded Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. They brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered them and said, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image that I have set up? And now if you're ready, when you hear the sound of all those instruments and every kind of music to fall down and worship the image I've made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. I also underline this part of the text. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? It's the ongoing question of Nebuchadnezzar. Which God is true? Which God has the most power? Which God will be able to rescue you? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Again, in your text that I sent you, I've underlined those two verses. We'll come back to them. In Nebuchadnezzar, he was filled with fury. The expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. And he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them in to the burning, fiery furnace. These men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. Because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound in the burning, fiery furnace. And King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished. And he rose up in haste and he declared to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? 
They answered and said to the king, True, O king. He answered and said, But I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire, and they're not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. I want to stop there for a minute. In the previous chapters, when Nebuchadnezzar made his outrageous demand, all of the wise men said, The only answers that you can find, the only one who can answer your requests, O king, are the gods, and they do not dwell among flesh. They do not dwell with us. Here again, Nebuchadnezzar's view of spiritual things is dashed to pieces. Verse 26, Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the fiery furnace and he declared, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire and the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the king's counselors gathered together and they saw that the fire had no power over the bodies of these men. The hair of their heads was not singed, their cloaks were not harmed, and no smell of fire had come upon them. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree. Any people, nation, or language that speaks against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will be torn limb from limb and their houses laid in ruins, for there is no other god who is able to rescue in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. It's an interesting thing that he makes the proclamation and then immediately makes a different proclamation concerning their god. Such is the wishy-washiness of a faith uh, that is not based upon the truth of the god of gods. The grass withers, the flower fades, the word of our God stands forever. Faith under fire. There's a lot going on here. That was a long text to read. Um, Hebrews 11, verse 33 and 34 says, uh, these, these heroes of the faith, they conquered kingdoms, they enforced justice, they obtained promises. Verse 33 says, they stopped the mouth of lions. We'll get there in a moment. In a couple of weeks, they quenched the power of fire. The writer of Hebrews is talking about the faith of these three men. But he goes on to say they escaped the edge of the sword. They were made strong out of weakness. They became mighty men in war and they put foreign armies to flight. Faith under fire. What is faith or Christian biblical faith? What does it look like and how do we live as people of faith? That's what's so powerful about this book. God's people have been scattered. They've been taken as slaves. They're in a kingdom that doesn't care about their religious freedoms. A king that, that one moment wants to tear them limb from limb, and then the next moment says, anybody who speaks against you, I'm going to tear them limb from limb. Always threatening to make people's homes piles of rubble. rubble. How do we live a life of faith in those circumstances? Well, narrative, I think for us, this Old Testament narrative is just so powerful for that reason. It shows us in a very real way. What does it mean to be faithful to God and yet work for a king who doesn't care at all about you? Human rights? Fairness? How do you serve? How do you know where to draw the line? I think the problem also for us, especially where we live, uh, faith has been misunderstood. Much of it has been mistaught in Christian circles, and we've seen lots of our brothers and sisters uh, confused and frustrated and angry. We think of a Christian faith as somehow being this instrument that, that we have in our hands, and that if we have enough of it, if it's good enough or it's strong enough, uh, then we're able to make life play out the way that we want. Faith as a, a type of confidence in, in certain outcomes and, and, and I run into it all the time. Someone facing some uncertainty, someone facing something that uh, an, an illness or a, a test that's come back in a, in a, in a negative way and, and people saying, well, it's going to be OK because I believe. And I, and I want to address that this morning. I want you to understand what's amazing about this story is the writer of Hebrews says these were men of faith. They were heroes of faith. 
And yet in the context even of Hebrews, they didn't conquer the kingdom. They didn't enforce justice. Oh yeah, the mouths of the lions was stopped, the fire was quenched. But they didn't become mighty in war. And they didn't put King Nebuchadnezzar to flight. Now I'm certain that these three and Daniel all longed for those things to happen. These three all longed for a return back uh, to the kingdom, maybe under David or under Solomon. They may have even prayed for such things. And yet they're men of faith. Faith in God and His promises. It became very real to me several years ago when a young man I was very close to uh, broke his neck. And as we were uh, helping him recover and go through therapy as a quadriplegic, somebody came into his room. And uh, you folks have heard me tell this story before, but it was just so profoundly sad to me, this misunderstanding of Christian faith. Someone came into his room, and they had a T-shirt. And they said, I, I prayed over this T-shirt. In fact, several of us have prayed. Our whole group has prayed over this T-shirt. And, and if you put this t-shirt on, we are claiming complete healing for your severed spinal cord. And the boy looked at me like, what, what on earth is going on here? I've never heard of anything like this. What does this mean? And, um, and so he put the shirt on. And uh, this person left. And he, he looked at me and said, is this, is this going to work? And I said, well... Um, God has every power to heal you. And I'm praying that God would heal you. But this is not how it works. We, we do not lay some claim upon future actions of our God based upon what we want the outcome to look like. It is not that way in the scriptures. That type of faith is very damaging and I know that I will offend some of you and I don't care it is damaging it is wrong it is not biblical it discourages the faithful over and over again I meet people who say I trusted in God and then this happened and what they've done is they've made this connection if I trust in God then this shouldn't have happened <clears throat> therefore God is not powerful, He is not real, or my faith is not real. Very, very damaging. It's also damaging into the world outside. Those people who claim that they have enough faith to cure the virus. Where are they? Frustrates me. Claiming things that God Himself has not promised causes those outside of Christendom to mock our God, to mock his people and their faith. So the sermon this, uh, on a sentence this morning is that biblical faith, it requires us to know God and to trust his wisdom, his love and power above our desires. Biblical faith requires us to know God and to trust his wisdom, love and power above our desires. So we're going to work through this text quickly. We're going to ask the question what biblical faith is not and what it is and how are we to live by faith. I want to tell you that what biblical faith is not, uh, I, I borrowed from Brian Chappell in his book, The Gospel of Daniel. He, he lists it and it's very common. What biblical faith is not. Uh, at least three things that biblical faith is not. First, biblical faith is not a trust in our quantity of faith. If I can get more people to agree with me, if we get larger numbers, uh, if we go on YouTube or we do something through Instagram and we can get 100,000 Christians to agree uh, that this is what we're supposed to do, then it's going to happen. Again, that's not biblical. You don't see any of that here. You don't see the Jews saying, hey, call all the people all around and let's, let's all agree that we're not going to die. It just doesn't exist that way. Biblical faith is not a trust in our quality of faith. Uh, I love the Apostle Paul. He writes about this uh, to keep me from being conceited, he says, in his letter to his church that he planted, to keep me from being conceited. 
because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations that were given to him, he says, a thorn was given to me, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, the apostle says, I'll boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Biblical faith is not dependent upon the quality of our faith. Three times the apostle says, I prayed, could I have this removed? And the Lord said, no, there is purpose behind your suffering, O Paul, and I will not take it away. Biblical faith is thirdly not a trust in our insight. And for us, verses 17 and 18 really are the key to understanding why these three are known as these champions of faith. Verse 17 and 18. Uh, I, I, well, let's read that. Uh, they're, they're threatened. The king is so angry out in front of all of these people. And, and, and again, it's not just in this culture. Christians in every culture get persecuted. When a government or a man says, worship me, worship the state. Christians say, no, I, I, I won't worship another God. Verse 17, this is their response. If this be so, <laughs> our God whom we serve is able to deliver us. And he will deliver us out of your hand. Verse 18, but if not, realize the power of that text. Those three are saying, uh, we're not sure what's going to happen to us. We're not sure. It, it, it may be one of two things, O King. One of two things is going to happen. God is either going to rescue us from this fire or God is going to rescue us through our death. Our lives are in his hands. You, O oh king, think you control, you control nothing. Nothing that is not given to you. And that's what Daniel has said earlier. That's what, what happened in the previous chapter. In, his, in the dream, Daniel says, King, you've been entrusted to all these things. The God of gods, the God of heaven. He's, entru he's, he's given you rule. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say the same thing to him. King, you, you may throw us in there and we may perish. But we're not going to worship you. Our God is in control. Their faith was not a trust in this proposed future that they hoped for. And I'm sure that they hoped to be saved from the flames. But what they're saying to him is, if we die, hey, king, if we die, it does not mean that our God can't deliver us. I love Esther. Esther goes to the king and, and, and she says, I'm taking my life into my own hands. And if I perish... I perish, but I will do what's right. Biblical faith, it's not trusting in the quantity, the quality, or even our insight. Of course, we pray. We all pray for things to go our way. We all bring our anxieties and our infirmities to God, and we pray for God to heal, for God to change. But we also pray to our God for wisdom. We also pray to our God for patience. We also pray to our God to give us faith in all that he has said about himself if things don't go the way we want them to go. We pray for assurance of his presence and for his love. Now, some of you listening may have thought, wow, I've really gotten this wrong. <laughs> really gotten this wrong a, a, a bunch of my life and I, I find myself continuing to to get frustrated and even quit praying and asking because it's kind of this watertight deal of if it didn't happen then I must not have had enough faith but last time I thought I had enough faith I really did I thought me and my family had enough faith and it was going to work out and we were all sure of it and it didn't work out uh, let me tell you this is good news actually because your your faith has been misguided your faith has not been in God. It's really been in your understanding of what you think the future should look like. It's really been in your understanding of what I think should happen and how it should look. 
And so uh, not necessarily uh, a wrong faith, but a misplaced faith. Our faith is to be in our God as he is revealed in the Bible. And in the Bible, the God of the Bible, he's not controlled by human beings. He doesn't give in to our whims. He doesn't change his mind because our faith is a little bit more than it was the week before. In fact, the whole text about a grain of mustard seed is, is for that fact in itself. Jesus says, you can trust in me. And it's not the amount of faith. It's not the quality of your faith, but it is based upon the object of your faith. So that what biblical faith is not. Secondly, what biblical faith is. Uh, biblical faith is trusting in God alone and above all else. I want to look at four things quickly in here. Again, back to verse 17. Biblical faith says God is able. And I've heard people say that when you pray things like that and you leave it open, that you're actually not having faith. And I, I tell you, you have more faith in God himself than you do in yourself when you pray prayers like that. Oh, Lord, I know you're able to heal this person. Oh, Lord, we long for you to heal this person. But if not... God, help us to honor you and to stay true to you. Biblical faith is believing God is able. Paul, the apostle, writes in Ephesians 3 this, this, this beautiful um, uh, benediction. Verse, verses 20 and 21, Now to him who is able, he says, to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think. According to the power at work within him, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Biblical faith is believing God is able. Oftentimes when I am counseling people, especially in relationships, and we sit and we pray, I, you know, can we pray that my spouse would be more understanding? Uh, can we pray that my parent or my child would obey? And oftentimes in the middle of that, I, I, I ask people, what do you think the greater work is? Sometimes the greater work for God is to change the heart of someone towards you. But sometimes the greater work is for God to change your heart towards a person that is unloving to you. Uh, for God to change your heart to a child that is ungrateful and rebellious and expensive. Biblical faith is believing God is able. Secondly, it is believing that God is good. The heart of our God is goodness. He is good. And that's what these three say to the king. Our God is good. He will deliver us out of your hand, O king. It's super important that Christians hold on to this, especially at the moment when things aren't going the way that you think they should. God is good. Think about this context. Godly young men standing firm in their faith and yet willing to be burned alive before worshiping another God. Believing in their hearts that all of the history in their lives has brought them to that moment, that it wasn't some mistake, that they didn't miss the turn somewhere. That God was bringing them to this moment in a public view of the whole known world and all the important people at that time. A king saying, I've got all this power, but it means nothing to me if I can't get you to bow to my statue. And those men saying, even if we're burned alive, our God is good and he will rescue us. Biblical faith is thirdly, believing that God loves his own people. He is good and he loves his own people. That means that it includes in our love from him is, is discipline. Being told no having things that are good and not sinful even, having them withheld and saying, no, I, I know he loves me. Fourthly, biblical Christian faith is believing that God is there. How wonderful is this? Verse 25, the king and all these rulers look and they say, there, there's a fourth person there. Did we make a mistake? Didn't we throw three in there? There's a fourth person and they're all unbound and they're walking in the midst of the fire and they're not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. 
Hey, Nebuchadnezzar, you know when you ask that question, what God can rescue you from my hand? There is one God who will rescue his people. I mentioned before this couple, Jack and Joanne Reed, friends and members from the Kirk of the Hills in St. Louis, a precious couple, used to sit on the second row on the piano side every Sunday morning, well-dressed, and they were the kind of faces preachers loved to preach to. Both Jack and Joanne suffered strokes in the same year. Uh, Jack was on one side of the nursing home hallway, and Joanna, Joanne was on the other side. And visiting them was wonderful, although it was difficult as Jack lost some of his ability to talk. We thought that Jack would go first. He was in worse shape than, than Joanne. But the Lord took uh, Joanne after she had another severe stroke and had been struggling. The Lord took her, and I remember going to visit Jack uh, that day with another minister, another young minister and I making uh, visits, hospital visits. And when we walked into Jack's room, he had this big smile, just a big smile. And he said, he looked at me and he said, he's done it. My Jesus has saved Joe. Did you hear? He saved Joe. And he was just, just beaming uh, because she had struggled so much in the last few days. And he knew where she went and he knew that she had been delivered. A beautiful story, almost textbook, the way I would love to uh, see my last few years on planet Earth. Jack followed her shortly after. I think it was within a month he followed her. And so, as we're talking about what biblical faith is, it means to trust God alone and above all else. And that's what we see in the lives of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They say, I know that God will deliver us from your hand, O king. Our God will deliver us. He will either deliver us from the flames or he will deliver us over our death to be with our king. So that leaves us with the third part. What do we, uh, how, how do we live by faith? What does it mean to live by faith? And, and we, we ask ourselves some questions in your outline. I, I put, what furnaces do we face? What does it mean to live by faith? Well, we ask ourselves some questions. What furnaces do we face? And I think it's important, as you read a story like this, and we do this all the time with biblical stories, you read this story and you think, if, if I was one of those four and I, and I was told I had to worship an image and bow down or get thrown into the flames, I too would say, no, I'm not going to do it. And, and people, we have to be honest with ourselves. Many of us would have figured out ways to rationalize it. Many of us would have blamed it's just a cultural thing. It doesn't mean anything to me. Uh, I, I, can, I can just, I can bow down. I, I'm not giving in my heart. I'm just doing something in front of people to protect my family, my wife. But we have to ask ourselves, which ways have we been tempted? And I think for many of us, it's the image question. What image does Satan want us to worship? Or what image does this world try to force us to worship? Uh, so the image in our story, it represented the king. It represented the king and his power and his authority. For us today, we don't have images in our government. We don't have statues, golden statues, uh, that we're forced to bow down to. But we do have an image. And I think for many of us, the image that we're tempted to bow down to is our own, our own self-image. Maybe it's an image of wisdom. It's the desire to portray ourselves as successful, as beautiful, as powerful as those in control. What image have you built that represents who you are? What image have you built that you demand others to give worship and honor that belongs to God alone in your family and in your business, in your relational circles? What images have you built? That's how we live by faith. We ask ourselves, have I put my trust and faith in anything above the living God? Maybe another question you can ask is, uh, what threat do I face? 
if I refuse to go along with everybody else and what they image and how, what they worship and how, how they have the priorities of life, what do I face? When we live by faith, we ask ourselves that. Is the threat of losing a job, is that enough to cause me to worship things that aren't our living God? Is it, is it a threat of money loss, of friends lost? Is it a threat of being cut from a team, ostracized in the family? What threats do I face if I refuse what all the people around me have placed as important in their lives? And so what does a faithful response look like? That's the question in my home life. What, what does it mean to be faithful to God above everything else? In my relationships, in my leisure time, even in culture and in finance, what does a faithful response look like? What images have been set up? What threats do I face? And how do I respond? I think it's ironic in the verse 22 to, to look at these two kingdoms and, and it's just it's bold and it's in our face. You have a king who sets himself up as God. A king who the previous chapter was told there is nothing you have that God hasn't given you. A king who sets himself up as God, who sets an image and calls people to worship that image. And if they fail to do so, threatens them with flames. And we as Christians have a king, the God of all creation, who says, I, I am to be worshipped above Nebuchadnezzar, above your family, your kids, your job. I am to be worshipped. I am to be given first place above all else. And yes, there's a threat of flames. It's interesting if you read the prophets Isaiah, uh, Isaiah and Jeremiah, they talk about the idolatry of the people, and they say that, the, that those who worship them become like them. Even says that they worship worthless things, and they themselves became worthless. So all along in this context, the prophets have been telling the people of God, do not bow down to idols. Although it was common, an idol represented whatever God had rescued them or saved them or had power over uh, a geographical region or fertility or war. You bow down to it. And he said, don't do that. So you've got two gods. One that says, bow down to the image and I'll spare your life. I'll spare you from the flames. And we have the real God that says, bow down to me alone and you'll be spared from the flames. The beautiful picture of the Gospel of Daniel is so vivid right here. Verse 22, those who worship the king, the mighty men of Babylon, they bind up those who follow Christ, those who follow the living God. They bind them up, these strong, strong men, and they throw them into the furnace. And what happens? Those who trust in Nebuchadnezzar are killed by the flames. And those who put their faith and trust in the living God are joined by either an angel or the pre-incarnate Christ there with them. What's beautiful about the picture for us Christians is our Savior faced the wrath and curse of God alone. Our Savior faced the punishment that our idolatry deserves. He faced that. In his crucifixion and in his death, he faced being alone, not, not with three of his friends in there, but being torn apart from his relationship with the Father and the Spirit and being cast into the flames. That's the amazing beauty of our gospel. I, I worship images. I have an image of myself. I have an image of myself as a pastor, as a father, as a friend. And I often look to that image to give me my worth and my value, my salvation, my security. And yet the good news is that Christ has taken the penalty for our idolatry. A life of faith says, I, I am not afraid to be confronted. 
I'm not afraid to have a good godly friend tell me, Mark, I think this has become too important. I think this has become an idol in your life. I think you're serving this. I think your anxiety and your fears come out of losing something that you feel like you can't live without. I'm able to face those things and say, yes, Christ has died for that and it has no power over me. The amazing thing about our gospel is those who have deserved to be thrown in the fire are rescued by their king. Now, this story doesn't end with these three men ruling Babylon, winning everything and never suffering again. But Jesus does rescue them. And God will rescue you, all you who put your faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, can claim the exact same promise. A life of faith says to this world, I know these things about my God. I know that he is good. I know that he cares. I know that he is with me and he will deliver me. He may deliver me through my death and my suffering, but he will eventually deliver me for all eternity. Now, we had some issues with our recording this week, and so we've spliced in this, this ending. And I just wanted to tell you, uh, the last song that we were going to sing was How Firm a Foundation. And it's a beautiful hymn that we sing, uh, probably familiar to most of you. Um, but there's a line in there that says, The flame will not harm you, I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. Uh, Because a Christian belongs to God, because a Christian realizes all of my sins, even the ones I'm unaware of, have been paid in full by Christ. When we face a flame, when we face trial, we know that's not because we don't have enough faith. We know it is because our God is purifying us in the midst of this. And as I said at the beginning, we see with these temptations that they get more and more severe. But we also see with these men that their faith grows and grows and grows, that they are encouraged to put their trust in the living God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the narrative that, that shows us exactly what it looks like to say, I know these things about our God and I trust in him. And yet, even if my body is given to the flames, As we see in a few weeks, even if the lions were to tear me limb from limb, I will not serve other gods because they cannot save. Oh, Father, we pray that the power of your Holy Spirit would work in your people, that we would have critical hearts and minds that look look to our own lives and say, "What, what images have I entrusted myself to? What image do I think? will give me security and peace. Oh, help us and lead us, we ask our Lord Jesus. Amen.